Calling Civil Action 18-5982 Echevarria et al. versus Facebook Inc. and related cases 18-6022 Bass Jr. versus Facebook Inc. 18-6172 McGuire versus Facebook Inc. 18-6246 King et al. versus Facebook Inc. 18-6263 Benda Toys at All versus Facebook Inc. 18-6511 Wick versus Facebook Inc. 18-6583 Menezes versus Facebook Inc. 18-6657 El Qasem versus Facebook Inc. 18-6887 Melades versus Facebook Inc. at All 18-6953 Schmidt versus Facebook Inc. Council, please step forward and state your appearances for the record. Good morning, Your Honor. Ariana Tadler, Milberg Tadler, Phillips Grossman, on behalf of the plaintiffs. Good morning, Your Honor. My name is John Yanchunas of the law firm of Morgan Morgan. Uh, I filed the Echeverria and Walker case. Thank you. Good morning, Your Honor. Andrew Friedman with Cohen, Milstein, Sellers, and Tull. Also for the plaintiffs, we filed the Menenzies case. Good morning, Your Honor. Douglas McNamara, Cohen Milstein, colleague of Mr. Friedman. Thank you. Good morning, Your Honor. Ryan McGee, and I'm with uh, Mr. Yanchunas' group at Morgan & Morgan. We filed the Echeverria and Walker complaint. Anyone else on the plaintiff side? Okay, on the Facebook side. Good morning, Your Honor. Andrew Klubach, Latham & Watkins, LLP, on behalf of Facebook. Good morning, Your Honor. Elizabeth Dealey, on behalf of Facebook, also with Latham & Watkins. Good morning, Your Honor. Sarah Turner, Latham & Watkins for Facebook. Okay. Thank you. Welcome. We're here for two things. One is the tutorial, which we'll get to in just a second. And the other is the case management conference, which will immediately follow. My law clerk will hand out to you uh, multiple copies. I don't think I have quite enough for both sides, but on, uh, of a tentative schedule that is a little brisker than the one you suggested. And we will, I'll give you a chance to argue with me over it uh, at, uh, when we get to the case management part. Uh, but I wanted to give it to you now so that Maybe at our first break you'd have a chance to look at it and take your Pepto-Bismol for your heartburn so that you'll be all ready to go whenever the case management conference starts. All right, so welcome to the court. Here's what we're going to do. We're going to teach me some things about this problem. I want you to know I do not have a Facebook account. There was, uh, I want you to know, so I, I have some general idea about how social media accounts work, but I feel like it's unethical for judges to have Facebook accounts uh, because one of you lawyers might try to be my friend. Then I would be in trouble, wouldn't I? So I'd just avoid that problem. I, I do think there is a, uh, I do think I understand the generalities, but uh, well, I want to learn about it. Also, I want to learn about hacking. So uh, there we are. That's why we're having this tutorial. So we, each side has 60 minutes to hold forth and educate me. Who on this side would like to speak first? Good morning, Your Honor. Again, my name is Ariana Tadler from Milberg Tadler Phillips Grossman. Say your last name again. Yes, sir. Uh, it's Tadler. T is in Tom. A D is in David. L E R. I don't have it on here. Maybe I do, but I have so many names. Where, where is it? Oh, oh, here it is, right here. Yes, Tadler. Tadler with a T. Yes, I sir. I got it. Okay. Thank you. All right, you go first. Well, I'm just going to uh, do a quick kickoff um, at council table. You have three firms. Uh, my own Milberg, Tadler, Phillips, Grossman, Morgan & Morgan, and Cohen Milstein, <clears throat> excuse me. Um, collectively, we have worked uh, to put together the tutorial for this morning. We have uh, some experts who will be here um, 
to talk about a variety of issues that are responsive to the questions that you posed in your order for purposes of today's tutorial. And in addition, um, there are quite a number of people in the courtroom who also represent plaintiffs and have filed some cases in this matter, and this has been a coordinated effort with, with support from well, they should uh, They should make their appearances if they're counsel in the, in the case. Are, are, are any other people here who want to make appearances? Uh, I think you should uh, uh, put your name on the record. Okay, now we're doing this by FTR, correct? And this is being recorded, but I need for you to say your name, but since it's on a tape recorder, uh, or digital recorder, we need to, so, so say your name again. All right, I heard that pretty clearly, okay, yes. But which particular case did you file? All right. All right, I got it. Okay, anyone else? Good morning, Your Honor. Karen Regal, R I E D as in Lloyd E L, Lockbridge, Grindle, Mallon in Minneapolis, representing the Nemesis Clinic. Okay, great. Anyone else? Good morning, Your Honor. Melissa Emmer, E N E R T, from Stall Stone Brody, representing the Mendotoes. Thank you. All right, anyone else? See, play, say your last name again. All right, thank you. Uh huh. You got to say it again, I just didn't get it. Well, no, but it also has to be clear on the uh, on the on the tape. All right. Thank you. Okay. All right. Okay. So uh, the reason we don't have a court reporter is, I think I've been told this on account of the. Uh, partial shutdown and the shortage of funds, but I had wanted a court reporter, but we have to do this today by FTR, the uh, tape recording system. But that's okay. We do that in a number of civil cases and it'll work out fine. And it's also by your consent, uh, someone had wanted this to be, uh, the tutorial to be uh, recorded. I think other judges in the country are interested in it and so they wanted to see what you have to say. So someday a judge in a distant part of the United States may say, well, you didn't say that on the tape. What you said on the tape was X. Now you're saying Y. So be careful. This is, this is, this is going to be used in other cases. All right. Are you ready to proceed? I am, Your Honor. Right. I'm actually here <clears throat> simply to make an introduction of Ryan McGee from Morgan okay. & Morgan, who is going to kick off the presentation. And I just wanted to reiterate, we welcome the opportunity to educate the court and to answer whatever questions you have throughout the course of today. So Excellent. thank you. Thank you for that. All right, so please come forward. And your name again? Ryan McGee, again with Morgan & Morgan. All right. And uh, Your Honor, I have printed out uh, hard copies of the slide deck as well as executive summaries and CVs for the two experts that we'll be calling today. Okay. If Your Honor would like those, I do have copies for opposing counsel, the clerk. Well, go ahead and give me whatever you think in the, in the easiest way uh, that you feel is going to help. And uh, Judge, we're going to begin the presentation with Miss Mary France. She has over 28 years of experience in the cybersecurity field. She is the CEO of Enterprise Knowledge Partners, LLC. She has served as an expert in numerous data breach cases. She's also a certified hacker, excuse me, a certified ethical hacker. She conducts penetration testing, and she's an information systems auditor 
and her CV and summary have been submitted for the court uh, today. And okay. Ms. France will be addressing the personally identifiable information, the value of that personally identifi identifiable information, and the industry standard practices to protect against hacking. All right. Great. And uh, that will be followed by Mr. Streeb, and I'll introduce him with his credentials. Okay. Well. Now, the, uh, let's have her come forward. She can stand right where you are. This does, she doesn't have to be on the witness stand, or did you propose to do that? Uh, we spoke yesterday with your, your court personnel, and they indicated the witness stand, but whatever worked for your honor. Well, it doesn't have to, this doesn't have to be under oath. This is a, just a tutorial. This, uh, I don't propose that it be under oath. Uh, if you want to do it under oath, okay. But, but uh, I, I feel, uh, is that all right with both sides? Uh, all right. That's so, fine, Your Honor. All right. So the expert can come forward. Still, I expect her to tell me the truth. I know she will. Uh, but uh, you, she can stand right there and be the professor as opposed to the witness. Unless you want to do it a different way, I'm okay. I can, I can absorb it any way you feel is best. I think it'll be easiest if she sits at the witness stand. All right. Have access All right. To please, uh, please take the witness stand. Uh, but again, I, uh, I, this does not need to be under oath. So just, just uh, you, uh, you testify as if you were a witness, but uh, this is not an evidentiary hearing. This is a tutorial. So uh, welcome to the court. Say your name again and use the microphone, please. Mary France. F-R-A-N-T-Z. F-R-A-N-T-Z. Yes. Okay, welcome, and counsel, go ahead. Thank you, Judge. Now, Ms. France, one of the first topics that we've been asked to speak about today and, and educate with the tutorial is personally identifiable information. And I'd like you to start off with a general explanation for the court uh, what's meant by personal identifiable information. Uh, personally identifiable information uh, in general are a series of data elements that can be combined that uniquely uh, distinguish any one individual to the point where they can be contacted or found. Um, and there are statutory standards by state as well as um, under the National Institute for Standards of Technology, uh, the FTC, et cetera, where they have certain data elements like first and last name, address, et cetera. And California has their own version that is slightly uh, uh, more um, comprehensive than, than the standard. All right. Uh, I can hear you perfectly fine, but does everyone in the courtroom, can everyone hear okay? Everyone's indicating yes. All right. Thank you. Good. And we've provided the, uh, the definition, but I'd like you to discuss the difference between what you call historical, or excuse me, what's referred to as historical and temporary personally identifiable information. Okay, so the, the, the context is basically how it can be used and the value of it. Um, so as from a, a hacking standpoint, we look at whether the personally identifiable information from an individual has a uh, long or short life based upon its use and value and, and who can find it. So, for instance, temporary, um, what we call in our industry, uh, temporary uh, PII is something that can be changed fairly easily. It doesn't mean that it's any less uh, disruptive to an individual as should it be taken. It just means that it has uh, more or less the ability for the individual to control it. So something like a credit card. Um, you know, you find out your credit card was hacked, you can go get a new one. Uh, you can change a bank account, things like that. So um, that have limited life, so to speak, in its value. Um, things that are historical are things you can't change, things about you that you can't change, such as your mother's maiden name, um, your employment history, um, your uh, social security number can be changed, but it's incredibly difficult, so that usually sits within the historical aspect. Information about you that is... Um, that determines who you are, you can be identified by it, and you're stuck with it for your entire life. That has a much higher value, and that's what we call historical PII. What was that first one called? Historical versus the earlier one was the temporary. Uh, tem we call it temporary, temporary okay. or maybe a, a, a limited life. The other one has more of a long or sometimes even infinite life. Okay, all right. And um, diving a little bit deeper into the value of personally identifiable information, can you explain what's meant by the term of FULLS, F-U-L-L-Z? Well, FULLS is a slang term uh, that we kind of use in the, in the industry also that, that's meant to say almost like a dossier on you. 
of when, uh, or on the individual of when we've actually uh, gained a whole bunch of information that, that allows somebody to potentially create a complete doppelganger of you in, uh, in the online world or even in the physical world. Um, it also oh, has word? Doppel <laughs> a, a duplicate um, um, of you so they could basically create your identity. Uh, uh, on it, in, it's not you, so they're creating a false identifier or a duplicate of Someone you. did that to me. Uh, they created a fake uh, blog, is that the word? Where they said it was, they pretended to be me talking about the Wingo case. Uh, I think most people realized it wasn't really me, but uh, but that was that would that be a doppelganger yes <laughs> okay yes it would All um right. so you know they can go online get a picture of you that is the original picture uh they can get your information your first and last name they can get information about your behavioral traits uh you know how you write and then they can actually emulate that online and pretend they're you well the, can you imagine what happens when people who don't know it's not you and they and uh, they can get fooled by that. So um, fools is is a little bit more broad than that. It's it's basically a lot of different information put together, and the more information you have on any one entity, the more valuable it is, um, just because you have so much that it's really hard to dispute. Okay, next question. And. Um, Ms. France, would you speak about the value of PII in general um, with, with regard to the, the interested parties? Well, the highest value, again, is the fulls or aggregated information simply because I have so much information about you. I can actually use that to uh, manipulate opinions, influence. Um, I, can, uh, it, you know, I can use that as an ethical hacker to do a social engineering campaign in which um, I can actually perform uh, phishing uh, exploits because I can do something that you're so comfortable with because I know you so well. So the more information you have uh, on an individual, more than information that's gathered on an individual, the higher the value is on, on the market from, uh, from a nefarious standpoint, obviously. Um, and you know, when, you, when you are able to take a huge history of an individual's behavior, particularly online, you can get comments that they've made, you can get who their friends are, you can uh, achieve uh, what they liked, what they clicked on, things that they purchased, and you put that all together in kind of a package. Um, and it can be mined to the point where um, you know, uh, whoever has that information it knows you better than you know yourself. And can you Explain how that applies to something like challenge responses. Well, challenge response questions are usually for me. So are you familiar with, uh, Your Honor? I'm sorry. No. Okay. Um, when, um, when you have a mul uh, some form of multi-factor authentication, so you don't just need a user, any, a user ID and password, or when you forget a password, you can set up sometimes a series of questions oh, like your mother's maiden name right, yeah, all right. right. I, know, I know what those are I, 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 what street did you grow up on right exactly you know, yeah. you know who, what was your first car things like that well when somebody has fulls information they can actually more easily if not very accurately answer those information on on, on someone's behalf and then be able to um you know get into their into their systems so challenge response uh, is one of the one of the easy ways that Foles is actually used. All right. And Ms. France, something we were asked to speak about is the dark web, but I'd like you to discuss the differences between the dark net and the dark web. Well, as a somebody in the industry, it's 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 more or less a um, a pet peeve of mine when the two get confused. But when when somebody says the dark net, they're really talking about the underlying infrastructure. Uh, the machines, the relays, et cetera, and the dark web is the services that rely on top of that infrastructure. So you have a network, and then on top of that you have the browser. And um, the, the dark net and the dark web are based upon anonym anonymity. Um, basically, it's used to protect the digital privacy of an individual so they can't be traced. Um, it's used for both good and nefarious purposes. 
And the way the dark net works is a system of routers and relays so that every single time somebody connects from point A to point B to get to a service, they actually bounce around quite a bit. The minimum is like three hops. So I'm going to connect to that machine, that machine, and that machine before I get to my source. And hence, I obfuscate the trail. It's very hard to trace uh, who I was when I started off. Um, so that's the dark net is, is that way. It's a series of routers and relays. And the dark web is the services that rely on top of that, sort of like we see in our normal browsers. Um, uh, services like email, uh, secure email in this case, et cetera. Um, and you can't really get to the dark net without using a browser or some sort of service uh, that relies on top of it. I don't get the difference between the dark net, which I understand what a router is and relays and those things, but I don't understand the difference between the dark net uh, routers and relays versus the ordinary ones that the, inter the regular internet uses. What is that difference? The dark net actually sits, uh, uses the same infrastructure, but they use devices that are not registered or indexed or named, so to speak. Um, so your regular internet, if you want to go to a website, a www whatever, um, the reason why that naming convention is known is because uh, it's been registered with the domain service um, and you type in the address and you can find where you're going to, okay? Um, the dark net physical infrastructure is a series of devices that aren't registered, they're not indexed, so to speak. Um, you can set up your own relay on it. Uh, it's not hard to do from a technical perspective. Um, but um, you don't name yourself, you don't say who you are. Um, and so when you get into the dark web, into the browser, it's not like you can just Google something, okay, with a, you know, look for a key term or something like that. You have to actually know where you're going. You have to know the actual address. And the addresses that you use in those browsers are not English-like. Um, it, it's not like I want to look for Facebook, so I, so I Google Facebook. It's um, I'm go I have to know the exact address, and the address is usually gibberish. It's actually a hash. So it's, uh, you, you have to be f fairly, um, you have to know where you're going and why you're getting there. Now, there are sites that have listings where you can find things um, because they've been gathered over time, but for the most part, it's meant for that anonymity. And it looks the same as the internet, except for, like I said, they're not registered, they're not indexed services. Um, so you have to know what you're doing and you have to know where you're going. Why does anyone want to be, uh, why would anyone want an address that's just a hash number? Well, if you're, if you're from a country that has a lot of censorship and you want to get, uh, you want to be able to do what everybody else does on the internet, you want to be able to communicate and collaborate just like you would the, the free net or the public internet, um, then the, uh, the, the method of the dark web and the dark net is to basically allow you those same services without being traced. So there's a, a lot of people that use the dark net and the dark web are not nefarious individuals. Um, I, so I had the uh, vague idea that dark net, no, dark web was illegal, but you're telling me no, it's not illegal. No, it's actually developed by the U.S. government, actually. Okay. Um, when the Internet first got started, they wanted a way to, um, to be able to use the collaboration capabilities of the concept of the Internet without having their information be available to the public. Ms. France, could you speak a little bit about how the dark web is used to traffic stolen data and stolen information? Well, again, that's the anonymity piece. Uh, and the lack of digital, uh, a lack of um, being able to trace you, so you, in, it's enveloped based upon digital privacy. Um, and they would use that so they can traffic without being caught. So if I steal something from you and I don't want you to trace who I am, uh, I'm going to go to the, to the dark web and uh, try to find a buyer for it, that sort of thing, and, and, and hope that I'm doing it in a way, because there are ways on the dark web to be caught, but I uh, hope that I'm doing it in a way that I can still get that information and trade it and buy and sell using the currency of Bitcoin, uh, and you can't see who I am. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, I'd like to move on. We, we briefly discussed it, but have a little more of a discussion of how personally identifiable information is 
misused with big data repositories. Well, remember we talked about fulls. I'm going to get as much information about an entity as I possibly can, and uh, the much of that information as it's gathered, particularly from very comprehensive uh, sites, social media is one of them, I'm going to take all that information about an entity and I'm going to put it into a large repository. Usually they reside on um, what we call NoSQL uh, structures, which I'll get into in a little bit, but um, very large repositories and I'm going to hold that and I'm going to hold that on usually either my own unique site or I'm going to stick them out on, on a dark net uh, infrastructure piece and then get to it via the dark web. But basically, um, I get all that information, I combine it as needed, I try to stay stealthy on the, on the uh, wherever I got the information from so they can't trace it back to me. But basically, the more I have and the more I can kind of trickle out there, uh, the more valuable it is and the more money I make. Um, now, there's some organizations that want it for their own, uh, you know, to steal IP, uh, some nation states, et cetera, but when they want to make money, sometimes they trickle pieces of that out there and they actually sell it on the, on the dark web. And w when you said that you wanted to trickle the information, does that indicate that it's sold off in pieces instead of these foals that you were describing earlier? Yes, because if I all of a sudden dump everything out there that I, that I let's say, stole from somebody, it's going to be, I'm going to be able to tra take that trail. And even if I can't catch the person or the individual or entity that did it, I actually gave it away that I just hacked this company, I just hacked the organization or, or whatever. And, you know, what happens is, is that the organization all of a sudden starts to lock down. They notify their customers that you've, been, that you've been hacked and people start to be a little bit more careful. So the value of it may drop for the short term. But again, that historical information stays out there forever. So my goal is, uh, is an advanced, and I want to make care, ethical hacker in my case, um, you know, my goal is not to get caught, okay? So dumping everything out there at one time is going to cause some red flags, specifically for people who are, you know, looking for that, let's say the FBI or something like that on, on the dark web. Okay, so my goal is to just trickle things out there and make it last as long as possible and never give away who I am. And sometimes I don't sell it myself. I would give it to third parties uh, that, that all they want to do is get a quick buck. Um, another thing that we often do when well, we when see... When you say get, get the whole thing, get millions and millions of items of information to, or do you mean trickle it out to those intermediaries? Trickle it out to the intermediaries. So let's say I steal your mother's maiden name, Your Honor, and, um, and your address, and let's say your phone number, and a few other things. So I want to make some money off of that. There's a couple ways of doing that. I, I only give out pieces of it, and maybe I make one piece of that completely wrong so that it, the, the value is diminished, but I'm also saving the data for later because it doesn't look like something was fully compromised, you know, uh, and it can't be traced. Um, so you do that, sort of like if, if I steal a car, I may sell it off in pieces and instead of just selling the whole car, one, it's really hard to trace because not all the pieces are going to be serialized so I can trace it back to the car that's stolen. But I also extend my, the value of that because I can sell the pieces off in pieces for greater than the cost of the whole. So I actually make money off of it that way. We're dealing with logical information so the car can be duplicated all over the place. Um, it's not a physical thing I lose at the end of the day. Uh, Ms. France, on this next slide, we have uh, this graphic of the high-level hacker life cycle. If you could just walk us through this, uh, the life cycle that you've displayed here. Um, well, this is a genericized um, hacker life cycle. Um, there's lots of copyrighted versions out there where people have developed very in-depth uh, methods and versions and, and um, testing criteria for this. Uh, this is a very genericized, but I want to point out one thing. The first thing um, that I do as an ethical hacker when we're hired to actually hack into a company is we look for what we call low-hanging fruit. So we're going to do reconnaissance scanning. We're going to monitor the environment. We're going to take a look at their websites. Okay, we're going to see what's available and we're going to do something called crawling the website. 
or crawling that particular service that they've exposed to the web to try and find um, data that we can use. And uh, sometimes websites are built very poorly, and when someone's logging in, if you're looking close enough and you know where to look, you can actually see user IDs and passwords, tokens and cookies, et cetera, exposed. Um, and we take that, and then uh, sometimes that's all we need to show, hey, you're, you know, we can get into your website. We can pretend that we're somebody else when we're getting into it, depending on how we've crawled or exposed that particular site. Other times we do a network mapping uh, called an Nmap. It's a common tool, it's free. Um, but again, I'm gonna do this as an, as an advanced hacker. I'm gonna try to be very quiet about it because I don't want the company knowing I'm looking at them. I don't want the entity knowing because um, they start to put in their own defenses and make it more difficult for me. So I become very quiet and I just take a look at it and see what I can find. So reconnaissance scanning tends to be the common denominator for the start of any type of hack. And sometimes you don't need to go farther than the reconnaissance scanning. Sometimes you get what you need and you can break into something. Sometimes you have to take more advanced steps. Uh, maybe try to get in there and see what the error messages are so it tells me about their environment. But re reconnaissance scanning is very common and um, most organizations that have anything of value are constantly being tested by unethical hackers to see what they can get and where some vulnerabilities or holes may be in their services. So let's say you have a, a website that um, lots of people use and there's private information in there. Uh, still, these websites say that they have um, secure steps taken. So I got two questions. One is, if that's true, how, do, how does a hacker even get through? And, and does the hacker somehow see machine language, see Java language? What, what is the language that the hacker sees when uh, they're trying to bust into a system? It depends on how well the system was built. Um, and that's pretty much the, the, the nuts and bolts of it. I mean, if the system is built very, very well, they try as hard as they can not to expose information that would give even someone a clue as to how to break into them. Um, if the system is not built well, then, then sometimes it's, it's, it's a free-for-all. Well, what does, the, what does the hacker see when, when they're trying to break into it? What, what appears on their screen? Well, they, they, we actually have a, a, a small, very short um, example of that. Good, let's see right. that. Okay. So this is a, a generic web crawl, and we did use Facebook, but I did not log in. Um, and this is a free tool that you can download. It's got a tutorial with it. It's called Zap. It's, it's free. It's been around for a very, very long time. But you see, as, as, as someone goes into www.facebook.com, all this information comes up. Now, that may not look very um, um, digestible by somebody who doesn't understand um, the technology, but for us, that's, that's the first place we look when we are hired to, to um, simulate a break-in. What is, I see those rows and columns. What, what does that represent? It's too tiny for me to read. I can't, okay. I can't when read someone goes in and types in www.facebook.com, there's a lot of stuff that happens between your browser, for instance, and the services that are being delivered to you. So this is the things that go on in the background. And now you can see them with the naked eye without using a tool, but it takes a little bit more skill depending on the browser. Um, this is just a free tool that exposes every bit of data that's going back and forth between your computer when you got in, and it, it doesn't have to be, you know, the, the current case, it could be anything that you get into. You can get into utility bill, you know, to pay that, and you'll see the stuff going back and forth. Uh, you know, you, you click something and you try to grab that service and it's delivering that website back to your screen, populating it based upon your credentials. Let's say you put in a user ID and password or you didn't, but it's populating that website. And so this is what's going on behind the scenes. What and page is number is that in your slides? Nine. Page nine, Your Honor. Let me see if I can read any of it. It's still too small, I can't read, I'm sorry. We can print a copy that will be larger for Your Honor, uh, provide it to Chambers after the hearing. 
No, it's, uh, no I, I, but is what is on page nine, is that the Java code? Is that Java code to begin with? Is that what that is? It could reference that. In this case, I think what it is, because I only did it for a couple of seconds, and I wasn't trying to, I wasn't trying to break in anything. I was just giving a small example of what could be seen. Uh, most of this is HTML and what is brought back and forth between the session uh, uh, on your on your browser session. So I, I again I go to um, um, a browser whether using Safari, Google, um, you know Internet Explorer it doesn't matter, and I type something in what you don't see right away in your visual screen. I never see anything like this when I do it. <laughs> uh, what, where this, how, how do you get this to come up? Well, I used a free tool called Zap that's part of the, uh, a web consortium that focuses on helping people uh, build secure websites. Um, and they're, they're cons a world-like consortium that have been around for 15 years. Uh, and so they produce these tools so that companies can use them for free or individuals or whomever can use them for free. And they can see what maybe somebody from the outside can see. So they know if confidential or protected information or information that would give uh, an, a hacker, a malicious hacker, uh, a clue as to how to break into their environment. Um, so this is a, a free tool. You can actually download it onto Windows and, and pull it up and very simply, without any knowledge of the tool at all, just type in the website you're trying to get into and this will show up. Are now, they, there are more are they, sophisticated tools, but this is a very easy right, free tool. Are they on page nine, are those individual lines, do they represent the communications back and forth between Facebook and the user? Uh, that seems like that's what you're saying. The, so, so these are the details of the communications back and forth between Facebook and the user? Yes, Your Honor, to a manner of speaking, it's really between your browser, not you in particular, but uh -huh. your browser and your browser session and, and the Facebook services, wherever they may be. Okay, so how would a hacker use that to then hack into the uh, Facebook system? Well, if I'm uh, <laughs> looking at it and I wanted to see um, how uh, or what information came back and forth, I'm going to put a search criteria on that, and I'm going to separate separate out things like uh, things that look like user ID and password that may be passed in clear text or even in somewhat obfuscated text uh, to give me an idea. I'm going to look for um, uh, links that call out to, let's say, internal infrastructure. I may look for cookies. I may look for tokens. I may look for a lot of different things in there. And, and I'm going to take that and I'm going to say, aha, let me see if this works when not going legitimately into this face, uh, into this, into this particular website. Um, and um, it's, we've been very successful with that type of reconnaissance scanning when we go in, when we're hired by organizations to see what can be seen from the outside. And so the screen that's up right now is actually um, the internal methods that companies use to protect themselves from this type of, of event. Um, so the whole goal of, of uh, corporations and, and small businesses and individuals who, who put stuff on the web is that they can use these types of tools and they can test themselves to see what it looks like from an external malicious hacker's viewpoint to make sure that they're not putting stuff out there that could leave them vulnerable. Because again, I'm going to be looking for low-hanging fruit. I could, as a, as a more of advanced hacker, I'm going to go a lot deeper if I don't find it and I, and I really want this information, I really want to get in. But um, what I just showed you was a very quick and easy way. Um, what, what organizations do with their own security is they use these types of tools to emulate what an external malicious hacker may see or do. So their steps are, first of all, to perform their own reconnaissance scanning to, from the outside in, to say, hey, what can be seen about me? Am I giving away something I shouldn't be giving away? Am I, am I living by, let's say, my privacy statements? Did I inadvertently expose something to the internet that I shouldn't have exposed that would either leave um, uh, um, a part of our business, the client, the whole company, or whatever at risk, okay? And then fix it, and there are ways to fix it. And there are methods and tools out there that you can continue to test to make sure you fixed it correctly. 
And then each step of the way, I go through this and I make sure that I'm following protocol that actually emulates. So if you, if the slide here shows the external hacker life cycle and then what organizations, what best practices to do internally at a very high level, I might add, to protect them from those malicious hackers. And uh, Ms. France, I'd like to call your attention to the next slide, the securing database is kind of a natural segue for what you were just speaking about. Could you speak about structured versus unstructured databases? Yes, yeah, so um, you now there's multiple types of databases, but I'm gonna talk about them in two different formats. Uh, structured, which is um, what we normally see with very large uh, mature databases and rows and columns where you have specific data elements and tools and you can query against them so you know what's in what row and what column and you can query and find that exact cell, let's say in a spreadsheet or in an access database or anything like that. Unstructured database uh, is um, basically a, 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 f um, a repository where you can put a large variety of data in there at once and you and it's meant for speed so volume velocity okay uh, is is two of the key words for that and you'll see that a lot of the um, data not only that's stolen in fulls format on the on the dark web is is stored in this when they mine it themselves and they put it on their own infrastructure but also large organizations that gather data uh, a lot of data about individuals, either for marketing or for um, mining purposes, et cetera, to find more information for, to, you know, to, to use that to, to be able to communicate with your users better, put it in these large NoSQL structures. And NoSQL is almost always open source. There are some paid versions of it, but it got started as free uh, software. Um, most expensive part about it sometimes is actually the hardware and the processing units that you put it on. but um, Unlike structured databases that have, uh, they're very mature and they have a lot of built-in security, unstructured databases are pretty much open. You have to create the security mostly around them. And you very rarely find, you can, but you very rarely find um, uh, encrypted data elements within a NoSQL no structure uh, simply because it, it increases latency, it increases the, the seek time to get to the data. So uh, you see most of the security actually being around it and preventing um, um, access to it and from it and putting it on isolated areas that, that you know exactly who's getting in there and who's not getting in there and you can control that, that type of traffic. It's just that you, you know, the, the goal is to have as much data as possible and make it as fast as possible. And if you start putting too much internal security, um, you actually slow that down. So the security, tends, oops, the security tends to be on the perimeter of a NoSQL structure and not necessarily internal to it. And Ms. Franz, would you review the best practices for the NoSQL that is on that next bullet point in the slide? Yes, so uh, basic things. When, if I were to download um, a free uh, framework or something like that on NoSQL, you'll find that all the ports are open. They have known default. Um, ingress and egress ports or how do I get in and out so you want to do things like change those ports you want to create access gateways to get into it uh, you definitely want to disallow uh, concurrent access by the same um, by the same credential getting in there simultaneously because that means that if I stole your password then I could use that while you're in there too um, also you want to create logs uh, so that you can audit that that cap that traffic going back and forth and what was taken and what was used and and all that so there's there's things that you build into that um, audit logs are pretty important because most structured databases have them built in but unstructured databases do not and uh, segueing from securing the databases can you just briefly touch on securing web apps so we use zap as the example when we were crawling um, the the facebook site there without even logging in uh, Zap comes from, like I mentioned, the OWASP uh, consortium, which is the Open Web Application Security Project. And they've been around for 15 years, and their whole goal is to, um, uh, uh, it's a group of individuals that have, um, that put out methods and ways that are just industry standard, or they set the industry standard to determine how to secure 
uh, websites like Facebook, uh, social media sites, um, anything that's really exposed to the internet. So they set out the standards for that. And they're most popular for what they call their top 10 vulnerabilities or their critical threats. And the top 10 started uh, sometime around 2003, I believe, and um, three uh, types of threats have been in there consistently since it started. One is cross-site scripting, which is something that I was looking at in that, in that uh, crawl, that zap crawl that you saw the example of. Uh, cross-site request forgery and broken access control. Broken access control actually, I'm sorry, cross-site request forgery started in 2007 as a known vulnerability for the way current websites are being built, but the rest of them, they've been out there for almost, you know, for over 10 years. And um, cross-site scripting specifically says, do that process where you're running and looking at it from an external hacker's point of view and see what's exposed. You want to look for um, the ability to bypass access controls, but you more importantly want to look for exposed cookies and tokens in there so that you can, you can re-architect it, and they, they give you lots of different formats to how to re-architect it, um, so that those particular items are not exposed, and therefore you can decrease that vulnerability. And what about, uh, briefly, cross-site request forgery, and then also the broken access control? Well, broken access control is when, um, well, it's a little bit more complicated, but basically broken access control in a nutshell, very high level, I want to add, is that I can get into that site without actually logging in. Um, and I can steal some of those things that are exposed and then use that to access it without being tracked, without, you know, I can bypass the normal method of, of uh, making sure that someone who gets into a site is, is the right person and is secure. We're going to run out of time. We've already used uh, almost 40 minutes of your one hour. Uh, let me ask you a question. Do, have you, uh, do you have a good uh, understanding now of what you think went wrong with the Facebook situation we're dealing with? And if so, can you explain it to me? Well, we haven't performed discovery on this uh, from Facebook's perspective at all. So we have it from what's been exposed and knowledge in the industry from being, let's say, an API developer, et cetera, uh, for Facebook. So we have some idea, but I, I do not feel qualified to talk about uh, any type of uh, uh, actual details because I can't back them up yet. I, well, I don't that, have that that's discovery. That's perfectly okay. I just <laughs> wondered if you I wondered if you did. Okay, now you need to be aware that when, when one hour, you know, that the time's up at one hour. So, so you got about uh, 20, 20 minutes. And that, that concludes Ms. Franz's pres right, presentation. All right, Ms. Franz, you've been very helpful. Thank you. And, uh, Your Honor, next we'll present Mr. Strebe, and that's Mr. Matt Strebe. Uh, he's got over 29 years of experience. He's the CEO of Kinetic IT Services, also the CEO of Synergy Cloud Hosting. He served as, as an expert in numerous data breaches. He's authored 18 books. He is the inventor of the No Transfer NOTX patented device authentic authentication protocol and his CV and uh, executive summary have been. Thank you. All right. What's your last name again? S-T-R-E. B E and Got he'll it. be discussing okay. authentication, access tokens, and the hacking of those access tokens. All right, please uh, welcome to the court and please go right ahead. Good morning, Your Honor. I'll uh, I'll speak very quickly. Um. <laughs> All right, no, no, you don't have to. I, but when when the hour's up, the hour's up. All right, go ahead. All right. So um, the things that I wanted to talk about were a little bit. I want to first let you know that I'm talking generally about some security protocols and not specifically about how Facebook works because. Uh, as Ms. France alluded to, we don't actually know yet. That's fine. That's than, fine. That's early in the case. I understand. Sure, sure. So generally in a web application, there are two big pieces of software. There's the server-side software that runs in Facebook's cloud infrastructure, and then there's the code that they deliver to the web browser that runs in the browser. That's uh, Now, is that browser on my, my desktop? That's right. Or is that somewhere in the cloud too. No. no, that's the that's the software running on your desktop. So right. this is a case where they are delivering software to you in real time and your browser runs it. That's the JavaScript language that you've that you've learned about. Mm -hmm. um, just to make things confusing, there's a totally different language called Java 
Um, but the one that runs in browsers is called JavaScript. Mm -hmm. So when you have a classic old school web application, uh, it was a very simple transaction between your browser and maybe a single server. You download a web page, maybe there's some JavaScript code in it, and it shows you on the screen what that website wants to show you. Security in those cases was controlled by a, a simple mechanism called a session. A session is like a phone call. When you first call somebody, you know who they are by their voice, or, you, or they identify themselves. That's an authentication process, right? They've authenticated with you, and you understand that because you're still on the same phone call, that it remains the same person. So session authentication is how simpler um, web apps, and especially in the early internet, did most of what they do. More sophisticated large-scale web apps that have billions of users, they have to, by necessity, use many hundreds to thousands of servers to store all the data that is stored. And so they have a problem that that early mechanism of using session authentication doesn't work well for all the different pieces of data that they have to put together. And when you load a, a social media web page, there are elements of data that come from all kinds of different servers. It might be um, that some of the, if you have a friend who's in France, his information may actually come from a server that's in France uh, because it's close to where it's normally used. That's one, uh, one possible example. It's often the case that different types of information, like videos or images, are stored in even entirely separate kinds of databases that are optimized for that particular kind of, uh, of object. So when you look at a, a social media web page, you're seeing data that comes from all over the place. And to, uh, and to handle that, there is a protocol that's kind of standard for, for Internet services called uh, access tokens. Access tokens I'm going to talk about kind of by metaphor, and with all metaphors it's a little bit imprecise. Um, but an access token is essentially an object that has all the security information that a server needs to know about you embedded within it. That information is put there by the server before it's given to you. They encrypt it so you can't really see what it is, but it has your identity in it. It has things like uh, expiration dates. It has some codes to make it a little more tamper-proof or uniquely identi identifiable. The key thing about access tokens is that once you log in, you go to a login server, it's like the security guards um, at the entrance to this building. Those guys are authenticating you. They take uh, your license or your passport. They're verifying that you are who you say, who you, say you are. Um, if we extend the metaphor a little bit and said that once you come in, they hand you an access key card that gives you access to the different rooms in this building based on what your role is, um, that's similar to how an access token works. So when you go to log into a web app, you log in, they hand you web uh, access tokens, and those are stored inside your web browser. A couple of different ways they can be stored. It's not really super critical. But those access tokens remain in your web browser. So when it goes to these dozens of different servers that, create, that composite the page that you're looking at, your web browser hands those servers the access tokens. The access tokens know how to read and decrypt them to see what it is you're allowed to have access to and who you are. They don't have to go back to those security guards every time they uh, get a request from you and suffer a whole bunch of delay and latency trying to get into every room that you might access in that social media building, for example. Um, Can I ask you a question? Sure. When a hacker uh, hacks into Facebook and allegedly steals 50 million, are they getting it off the server, the central servers, or are they going into everyone's individual computer to get the uh, access tokens that have been? They're, they're getting them off the central server. They are not accessing everyone's individual. Okay, computer. so it's off. All right. And the way that can happen, we'll talk about in a minute. Um, the bottom line is, so I'll, I'm going to, in, in the interest of brevity, I'm going to, I'm going to probably go through this a little bit quicker. But the tool that Ms. France showed you, that showed individual transactions going back and app. forth, is app, yes, yeah. between a web browser and a web server, um, 
shows the many dozens of transactions that are going by. Oftentimes, those transactions are authenticated on the server side with these access tokens. So there's a couple different types of access tokens. You can have a token that's specific to you, a judge, and it's going to get you into your chambers and into your courtroom and into the areas of the building that are appropriate for you. There might be other kinds of access tokens that are, for example, the people who bring the food to the cafeteria. They may have a, a, an access token that's used by that vendor, like a, without identifying an individual person. It gives them access to the kitchen and they can, they can put food in the kitchen. You can have uh, access tokens that are uh, for the security guards that give them wide access that they may need in, in times of an emergency. So access tokens contain within them the permissions that you have to move throughout the building so that when you present them to a door, that door will open, right? That's how that, basically that's how the metaphor works for, uh, for gaining access to all these different elements of data. So one of the problems with access tokens is that they're a bearer instrument. If you've got a token and it's still valid, it's unexpired, however you obtained it, you can emulate the user that's identified within it or use whatever permissions are um, granted by it. So the question hackers are looking at is how do I obtain other people's access tokens? Um, so access tokens are protected a number of different ways. When they're transacted between computers, they're encrypted while they're moving over the internet. They're encrypted when they're stored on the computer's hard drive. But they have to be available and open and unencrypted for use when they're to a certain degree, and there's some, there's some inaccuracy there, but um, when they're inside the running web browser so that the browser can hand them back to the server. Now there's another layer of internal encryption that uh, the, the token is still encrypted for you when it's on your browser, when it's transacted back and forth in that list of back and forth transactions you saw in Zap. Your computer never decrypts it. You don't have to be able, aware of what's in it. Facebook has the, or, or whoever the web application is, has the decryption key and the encryption key. They put all of the permissions information and access control lists inside that token. They put the identity information in there. They hand it to you so you can give it back to them. It's just like your access badge. The security guards give it to you. You're giving it to the door or to other security guards as you're moving through the building. You don't have to know what's on the card. You just know what it allows you access to. And then, Mr. Street, could you discuss how one could exploit flaws to obtain access to those access tokens? Sure. Uh, in the metaphor uh, that, that we've been talking about, if you come into this building and the security guards take your passport and your license, that's a long-term form of, uh, of an access token. It, it, you keep it. You don't use that license to open the door. You use a short-term key card that they give you, in this metaphor, the guards give you a card that's valid for some period of time and for the doors that you're able to open. Um, if those security guards make some kind of a mistake, and some of these mistakes are going to sound a little silly and obvious, and they're not applicable to what happens necessarily in this case. We don't know yet. But for example, if I come in and say to the guard, I need access to room 12, if instead of making me a unique access card that has a very specific permission to open this door for room 12, if they instead said something like, well, here's Judge Alsop's card. He has access to room 12. Just use that. Um, then I've also got access to everything else that you've done. That would be a silly mistake, and I'm not saying that that's what happened here. But those kinds of architectural mistakes are what occur in these kinds of situations. Somehow, through some method, some architectural flaw or bug in the software, the wrong access token is provided to an end user, maybe through a series of complicated, um, uh, of complicated interactions, but hackers figure out how to tease somebody else's access token out of the authentication login servers or out of the web application servers. And they do it by using tools like Zap to examine what's going by and making you know, educated guesses about what they might do to, to change or uh, w what's happening. And Mr. Streeb, on this, what's now slide 17, we have a photo of the web inspector. Sure. Could you just briefly explain what that is? So this is a picture of a social media website. And this is a regular web browser. Um, m most, if not all, web browsers have special extra tools that are built into them for software developers to use. 
so that they can uh, examine what's happening inside the browser. So right here you see I'm just going to this menu item that's built into my web browser. It's called uh, Show the Web Inspector, for example. And what we're looking at now are actual access tokens. These are uh, embedded in the web browser. They're stored here when you use um, when you use this site for some temporary period of time. The highlighted one there is, for example, an actual access token. I don't know what it means. That's just a random string of letters and numbers with some dots and dashes in it. Um, I'm not sure what its purpose is without going through some level of discovery. But the bottom line is that's what they look like. They're kind of, this one is this long. The length of them varies depending on how many permissions or access control entries they might have inside them. What's put inside of an access token is entirely up to the web application developer. And um, are, are these encrypted or are these decrypted? These are, well, most of these are encrypted. Some of them are actually not encrypted and some of these are not access tokens. Okay, and in the interest of time, we'll move on to um, OAuth 2.0. If you could explain for the judge uh, and the court what we mean by OAuth 2.0. Sure, OAuth 2.0 is the protocol that implements these access tokens. It's a standard that was put together by a web standards body. Um, it's used by a number of different web application sites. Um, so, and, and what's the interplay between latency and security with OAuth 2.0? Well, so just as with a, uh, an access badge, there are vulnerabilities to access tokens because they're bearer instruments. If you were to lose your, your access badge, outside in the street and a person who's not authorized to be here wanted to enter the building and we imagine that the security guards don't know who you are otherwise and trust the bearer instrument that they're handed then that person can get in so because it's a bearer instrument there are these vulnerabilities and they're oftentimes limited by having a very short expiration time um, sometime and but that's totally up to whoever writes the software for the for the web application. It's oftentimes a trade-off between security and ease of use. To make it really easy to use a website, to reduce kind of barriers to growth or barriers to obtaining clients, it makes sense for companies not to do things like pop up a login dialog box every time you um, start the website. So you might log in once every few weeks or once every few months instead of every time you go there. It makes it simpler and faster and uh, but it leaves a token on your browser that may be somehow taken and used by other people. For what example. is the difference between these uh, tokens and a password? So the tokens contain all of the information necessary to gain access to a website um, without you having to prove who you are. They give you an authority, but they don't authenticate you. The assumption is you've already been authenticated by an authentication service and the ability to decrypt that token proves that you were authenticated at some point in the past. And Mr. Streeb, how does that tie in with the, the view as function that's at the issue of this case with tokens and access tokens? Well, without the benefit of discovery, of course. Yeah, without the benefit of discovery, what, what appears to have happened is that there's a feature in Facebook that allows you to see what you look like to other people. So for example, if you have a person, well, I might not want my mom to see all of the same posts that I show my friends because I have different aspects of my life that I expose to my mother than I expose to my friends. So it makes sense for me to know when I post something whether or not my mom can see it. So that view as feature uh, appears to have been implemented in such a way that it would have passed my mom's user token down to, um, to, to me when I'm using that function in certain specific cases. And so one of the problems with uh, OAuth that developers have to be very careful about is that they never send a token to a web browser that doesn't belong to that user. It's a, it's a, it's a vulnerability that's known about the protocol and it's something that, that developers have to be vigilant about. If hackers were able to exploit a website to obtain a different person's access token and then use that token to see more tokens that belong to other people, 
then they could repeat that process with an automated script. Well, take your example. I still don't understand this quite. I understand that you you want your you, you want to show your friends different photos than your mom, but when you do use the view as, how are you pretending to be your mom and using her access code? To, how, how does that part work? Well, so n w Facebook has their own method of doing this, and I don't want to assert that I know what that is yet. Um, I only know a few things that have been made public that are fairly vague about it, but it appears that, um, yeah, they're creating, you remember when I mentioned that your, your, your web page comes from many different servers and every data element on it comes from different places? It might be a simple way to compose a page for you from somebody else's viewpoint if you were to use their um, permissions to do it. And that way the, the page gets assembled in the same manner as it would be assembled for that other person in a very simple way. That, that's a possibility. But, so you're saying literally, if I understand you, that you looking at on your Facebook page would say, I want to do the view as, and then you would type in your mom's name and and your and somehow the computer would use her access code to to it would. It would be safe to do that to some degree if the access token always stayed maybe on some server that Facebook owned and was never delivered to my web browser. But if because of a combination of features or a mistake or something like that, her token was ever actually delivered to my web browser, then it could cause a vulnerability like All right, that. Right now, let's be clear, you, you're just speculating here. You, you, you don't know that that's the way it... That came that's down. Right. Okay. All right. I'm speculating. All right. So I, I, I'm saying how these things could happen generally to a web app mm -hmm. based on you know many different things. So all right. And we we you got about two minutes left. Right. Right. All right. So the only uh, so we do have some preliminary questions that that we need to know in order to figure out um, you know really what went wrong. Um, how was the the view as uh, token developed? Uh, how does Facebook test the security and functionality of that prior to release? Um, what processes do they use to test their features like view as? Um, and in general, what security development processes, practices, and policies does Facebook use to test their software prior to release? Um, when did Facebook first detect this issue and how did they detect it? Um, when did they identify the root cause of this issue and how did they identify the root cause? Was any report developed by Facebook internally or by a third party to discuss the issue? And how did Facebook determine who was affected by this? What steps did they take to contain and remediate the issue? Those are okay. All. You're you're getting more into the uh, our argumentation here, but all right. Okay, let's let's bring yours to a close. I thank you very much for your assistance. Thank you for the All opportunity. Right, let's, let's go to the, uh, we'll go to the other side for about, uh, uh, you have an hour or two. We'll probably do about 15 to 20 minutes, find a legitimate breaking point, take a break, and then come back and finish your part. So uh, how would you like to proceed? Uh, Your Honor, I think we just need a moment to switch the technology so that we can load our sure, go screen ahead. in. Up. Literally just a moment. That was incredible. Um, Your Honor, Andrew Klubach, again from Latham & Watkins, on behalf of defendants. Um, Your Honor, first of all, we appreciate this opportunity. We have endeavored to adhere to the questions that you asked about in your order, uh, where you asked us to talk generally about the issues related to this case, and then you identified some specific topics. Uh, in particular, you'll see our, I, I hope our presentation is designed to go right to the issues you asked. There was a little bit of discussion about some of the specifics related to the case, and as, as just as plaintiffs, uh, we did not, uh, we're not intending to get into the that's a, that's details. Fine. That's fine. Uh, but there are some uh, general uh, issues, and there are some discussions about Facebook that will be discussed in the general context of security um, without the, uh, getting into too much in the details of this case. Although there are, there is uh, uh, information that has been publicly disclosed on blog posts and to the extent we need to clarify some of the questions you had uh, uh, referring to that information, we're happy to do that. Um, 
In particular, Your Honor, we categorized or, or um, uh, put this uh, presentation to four different areas. Uh, the four areas, broadly speaking, uh, are how do at attackers get access to data? Uh, what do attackers do with compromised data? How do companies, you said the industry, uh, defend against attacks? And then we talk specifically about Facebook's general approach to security, although without getting into the details of this particular. Now, Your Honor, we have these four sections, and it may be after the first one. That will be a nice uh, stopping point for a break. Sure. We have two presenters uh, today, Your Honor, and uh, the first presenter who will uh, speak to the first subject of how attackers get access to data is named John Milliken. Now, Mr. Milliken works for Facebook. Uh, he's a member of the privacy infrastructure team. Uh, he's from London, which you'll be able to tell immediately from his accent, I think. Um, and he received his degree in computer science from Cambridge. Uh, back in 2012, he won uh, Britain's Cybersecurity Challenge UK, which was a nationwide competition about cybersecurity. Um, he joined Facebook in 2014, and he s spends uh, his time working on building privacy-enhancing features. Uh, in particular, recently, he's been working on developing improved approaches uh, for end-to-end -end encryption, which is one of the specific subjects you asked us about. Uh, he works with external groups, uh, including the uh, uh, Internet Engineering Task Force Messaging Layer Security Working Group, uh, which is a worldwide organization that is, uh, in, in this particular uh, case, working to build uh, protocols for pushing the state of the art in encryption technology. He's authored peer review publications, including one on authentication and one on encryption protocols. He's spoken at a number of conferences, uh, including where he was a keynote speaker at a conference hosted by Parliament, where he actually demonstrated for uh, members of Parliament how an attack could. Uh, take place. In this case, it was on the BBC, uh, and he'll talk a little bit about that, uh, and, um, and that's his general background. He's going to speak to the first section. Um, I guess I'll hold off talking about the second and third and fourth, because that, I think, will be a natural. All right, let's bring him forward. And, Your Honor, um, maybe it'll be more convenient for him to be at the... That's fine. Uh, that's, that's fine. Yeah, again, you don't have to be under oath. This is a tutorial. Uh, it is being recorded, though, so it might be used in the future. Uh, welcome, sir. Thank you very much. Say your name again. Uh, my name is uh, Jonathan Milliken. Okay, welcome. Please go ahead. Thank you very much, and uh, good morning, Your Honor. Thank you for the opportunity today to talk to you about cybersecurity. Of course. Um, so I'm going to start by talking about how attackers get access to data. Um, and it's, it's easiest to frame this discussion uh, with sort of consideration of what the fundamental challenges are um, with cybersecurity that uh, make the field of cybersecurity a little unique. Um, so to start with, uh, the internet is open by design. Um, and this is, uh, this is a good thing because if you're running a public website, for example, it's actually quite desirable for this to be accessible for anywhere, for your business to be able to reach people who are anywhere. But this does also mean that uh, attacks can be launched from anywhere, potentially by anyone and at any time. Uh, and also, uh, because attacks are just uh, information or code that are running, it's relatively easy for these to be replicated across the web and are often automated. Um, another issue is that um, when we're talking about complex online systems, um, the, the fact that they are so complex um, essentially means that bugs are inevitable, and some of these bugs can result in vulnerabilities. Because uh, we're talking about code bases with millions of lines of code um, in which uh, there are millions of potential interactions uh, which can't all be predicted or tested, and particularly as these systems evolve over time, um, predicting what things may happen in future is, uh, with existing code is very um, very challenging. And it's also a very uh, asymmetric enterprise to defend against attacks um, because fundamentally if an attacker has a goal that they want to achieve, they only have to find one way that they can succeed in achieving this. Um, they only need one exploit that can do it. Whereas in defense, um, you need to be concerned with the entire attack surface of places where these attacks could, could happen. Um, and 
So if we want an analogy for the challenge of cybersecurity, um, people often think about a, a safe, um, but this isn't really a great analogy, um, simply because um, a safe, for example, has a pretty specific security goal. So for example, that only the person with the key can access the contents. Um, you're concerned about, concerned about a limited number of security properties, for example, the, the strength of the box or whether the lock can be picked. And it's de designed in advance of use. It's not some evolving system. Um, so a much better analogy would be a uh, city, for example, where, for example, there are many different entry points, um, say by foot, by road, etc. Uh, but also perhaps uh, things which aren't designed for humans to enter, say, the sewage system. Um, a city is constantly evolving. It wasn't designed at some point. It's, there's always construction going on, for example. And its threats vary widely. So, for example, uh, you may want a country's military to defend it against invasion, but also um, kind of smaller threats, such as people failing to pay for public transport usage, for example. So it's a much, more, a much closer analogy with many different entry points. It's evolving, and there are just kind of broad risks, many of them unpredictable. And I mentioned this notion of an attack surface on the first slide. Um, so it's worth briefly defining this. Um, so this is all of the points on a network which might be accessible to an external attacker. Uh, and so in a, in a highly complex system, this is likely to be very broad. Um, so for example, if, um, if you're running a website, your attack surface could well be um, the servers running your website, um, the website itself, the user interfaces that are provided, uh, any developer interfaces that allow third parties to interface with your websites, um, the email accounts that your employees use, and any other portals which these employees use to log in, and then any other third party systems that uh, your site may uh, connect with. Um, but that's just a, a, a few examples. There are many more possibilities. So let's look at how a few attacks uh, may happen. Um, and uh, these examples will um, all be somewhat simplified, but they're designed to kind of give the rough idea. Um, and uh, so this, this first attack uh, is an attack on internal systems. Um, it's um, sort of an, an instantiation of the high-level hacker life cycle that we, we saw in the previous tutorial. Um, and so this example may, for example, start with a phishing email. A uh, phishing email being a, an email designed to trick someone into doing something against their interests. Uh, for example, it may contain an attachment uh, which is actually malware, so software designed to damage the computer or gain an authorized access in some way. Um, so in this example, if we have a malware attachment and an, uh, an employee opens it, then this might give an attacker um, control of the employee's computer, um, which can then serve as a foothold into the company's network. And when you say open, do you mean open the to, to, to open the email or click on the attachment? Um, typically these days it would be clicking on the attachment specifically. Um, ge okay. Generally, just, just opening an email wouldn't uh, succeed these days, although I couldn't say for certain if that's always the case. Okay. So we'll just, we'll, we'll just take that example. When you click on the, you get the phishing email and then there's a thing I, I know enough not to click on it. I, I'm afraid to even open them. So, but uh, 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 so, but uh, but let's say you click on it. So, what happens then if it's a malware? So, um, it depends really. But uh, typically, we'd expect it to exploit some vulnerability, which allows it to gain access that it shouldn't. Uh, I have, have a few slides on vulnerabilities uh, right. later on. Okay. Are right, you proceed? Thank you, Yarn. So if an attacker has a foothold into the company network, this is now a point where they may be able to gain privileged access. And so this device may already have privileged access, or it may be able to move elsewhere within the network so that, it, so that they do. And so if an attacker's goal is, for example, to steal data from the company's database, once they've reached a point in the network where they can access this, um, the malware can simply exfiltrate the data back I say simply, this, this, none, none of this is necessarily simple, but um, the, the compromise, of course, has made it significantly easier for the attacker. So uh, let's look now at another attack, which could be an attack on a web platform. 
Um, and so um, on, on this slide, we're seeing um, the attacker is using a website directly. And so this screen, this web interface, um, is their own computer. And so what might happen is an attacker experiments with a website and they go looking for bugs. Uh, for example, uh, potentially using the tool that uh, Ms. France described earlier. And sometimes they'll succeed and sometimes, sorry, sometimes they'll fail, but sometimes they'll succeed in finding a bug. And if there is a bug, then sometimes these will result in vulnerabilities, which can then be exploited again to exfiltrate data back to the attacker. And this could potentially be the same sorts of data that could be accessed uh, with the direct access to the company database in the previous example. But, of course, the attacker in this instance hasn't ever uh, been inside the company network. They haven't gained privilege access in that way. Another potential attack um, could be an attack at the point that data is transmitted to a user. Um, and so uh, the previous tutorial discussed about how um, you mentioned about uh, how connections go through a variety of routers and switches. And so no connection is direct. Um, and so if one of these uh, uh, routers in the middle is malicious, for example, a free, free Wi-Fi network that you may connect to in a coffee shop, um, if someone sets one up and you can't distinguish that from the, an actual legitimate one, then this can potentially mean that when you connect to a website, an attacker can then uh, control and manipulate your connection in various ways. Um, and it's potentially easiest to uh, describe this by way of example of the attack that uh, Mr. Klubot described, the high um, uh, demonstrated um, at this conference run by the UK Parliament's ICT forum a few years ago. And so, well, in what was that? Are you going to explain that? Absolutely. Yeah, yes. please explain that example. Um, so, in this example, um, uh, in the conference uh, before before my talk, I set up uh, a, a Wi-Fi network called Dubious Fake Network just to make sure that they, they'd know not to connect to it. Uh, but I invited anyone who wanted to participate in the demonstration. It was called what? Dubious Fake Network. Fake? Yes. Um, Did it, people connect to it anyway? Um, when I invited them to, oh, if, okay, if right. they wished to um, participate in the demo. Uh, but uh -huh. certainly I wanted to make it clear to them uh, that th th this was not something that you would typically want to do. Um, and so I did warn them that I was in control. But this network, it behaved exactly like a normal Wi-Fi network, unless you actually connected to the BBC News website. Now, the day I gave this talk was uh, Halloween a, a few years ago, and so I, I replaced the headline that they would see with um, a story about a zombie apocalypse um, occurring in London. Um, so in this case, it was obviously fake, but um, if someone wanted to attack you uh, in real life, it's, it's likely that... Um, for example, maybe they, rather than manipulating the data, they would just observe the data being transmitted and try to steal anything that was sensitive that had been sent. Um, and fortunately, I should just say that the BBC News website is no longer vulnerable to this as of last year. Uh, so you, you were able to break into the BBC? Oh, uh, sorry. <laughs> I, I should clarify this. I, I did, I, at no point did I break into the BBC or access any of their servers. Uh, this was just at the point that the website was delivered to the user. So it was happening on the router that I was running that they had connected to, rather than in any way damaging any DVC assets. So someone who was at the conference wanting to tune into the BBC News would get your thing about zombies instead of the real thing? If they were connected to dubious fake network, then yes. I see. But if they were connected to dubious fake network, perhaps they shouldn't have been surprised by that. I see. <laughs> okay. So finally, I'd like to, t to talk about an attack on uh, user devices. Um, so this is a little different from uh, the previous attacks because these could be out of the website's control. Um, and so in this instance, uh, let's say an attacker wants to infect the devices somehow. For example, using a phishing email like in the previous example. Um, sorry, not the previous, the example of you um, that I started with. But then the attacker can um, either take data from the di device or wait until the user, say, connects to a website which they're sending sensitive data to, at which point the attacker can read that data and, again, exfiltrate it back. So you asked about how these, uh, how these attacks may happen, um, say, how, how malware may take control. 
Um, and the answer here is really th there are software vulnerabilities out there and these attacks often exploit them. And actually most of the time we're looking at publicly known vulnerabilities in, in third-party software when you say if you're talking about a company you're not talking about their own software but software that they're running from others. Wait, I don't understand that point. Say, oh. that, say that again. Um, so um, within a com like no company will run exclusively its own software. Um, they, they run a software from a variety of vendors, potentially including themselves. And so any of this software which they're running on their network um, has the potential to contain a vulnerability. Um, and often these are publicly known. Um, so uh, they can be uh, reported in this, this database called Common Vulnerabilities and Exposures, uh, which is uh, totally public. Uh, thousands of these are reported every year. And typically there are patches available, but often attacks will happen because uh, people or companies have failed to ensure that these patches are actually installed to protect them against these vulnerabilities. So if we look at publicly reported vulnerabilities over time, we can see in the late 90s, we were looking at a few hundred per year. But now, say in 2018, there were almost 16,000 of these um, reported. And this is actually- Is that new ones per year? 16,000 new ones per year? Yes. <coughs> or just under, yes. Wow. And so this is a good thing because it, um, these databases being public does help companies to understand what their risks are and um, understand when they're vulnerability and when well, sorry when they're vulnerable and when they need to patch their systems um, but it's also very useful to attackers because they're often able to scan for vulnerabilities and see which companies are actually um, exposed to that threat but there is another class of vulnerability um, which we um, is called zero day vulnerabilities and so it's much rarer that an, that an attack will use one of these um, and these are named zero days um, because um, a defender has had zero days of knowledge about this bug before it's used. So um, having not known about it, they haven't had a chance to fix this vulnerability. Um, and it often requires sophistication to identify uh, because uh, a, a company will typically be able to pr prevent um, a lot of the um, low-hanging fruit, for example. And so... If, if no one else has caught them before it's been attacked, then that, that innately means it's going to be harder to find them. Um, but using them doesn't necessarily require this same degree of sophistication uh, because it's often possible to buy exploits for zero-day vulnerabilities, for example, through criminal networks. <coughs> and uh, I believe that's the end of this section. Uh, Your so Honor, is this a time when you'd like to take the short break? Yes, this would be uh, a good time. and. Let's see, you've used about almost 20 minutes, uh, so not quite. So we'll resume there. Okay. And take a 15 to 20 minute break. Thank you. Thank you very much, Your Honor. All rise and come to order. Court is back in session. All right, be seated. Thank you. And before we resume, please be seated. Uh, before we resume, I've got to ask two questions for all of the people up there be sure to speak into the microphone <coughs> so that the recording meaning the television recording catches what is spoken that's one point second is do count will counsel on both sides send me your deck of slides actually send them to the court clerk and do you have any problem with us putting on the court website for public view the slide decks that you sent in? That's fine, okay? Your Honor. Both sides okay with that? Yes, Judge. All right, please do that sometime today. All right, next witness or next, next presenter. Uh, thank you, Your Honor. Um, the next person who will present on the subject of what the attackers, what the criminals do with compromised data is someone who's, who's uh, very able to speak to this. Uh, he is a partner at Latham Watkins, where he's one of the co-heads of our firm's cybersecurity and data privacy practice. But more importantly, he spent 10 years as an assistant U.S. attorney in the Southern District of New York, where he was the lead cybercrime prosecutor for the office. Um, during his time at the U.S. Attorney's Office, he handled a wide range of cases uh, involving computer hacking, trafficking stolen data and as well as major investigations, undercover operations, takedowns of criminal websites that operate on the dark web. 
uh, amongst other notable cases, uh, Mr. Turner led the prosecution of the operator of the infamous Silk Road website, uh, which was a vast online black market that operated on the dark web. Um, Mr. Turner also was involved in supervising uh, what is now publicly known uh, at the time was very confidential, an FBI sting operation known as Operation Card Shop, which was an extensive undercover <clears throat> investigation into criminals who were involved in hacking and stealing credit card data, which could be used for identity theft. Um, so uh, Mr. Turner will uh, try to help you understand the mind of the criminal from this perspective. All right, excellent, thank you. Morning, Your Honor. Good morning. Um, so Mr. Milliken talked about some of the ways that attackers can compromise user data. Um, I'm going to talk about what they do with that data once it's been compromised. And the short answer is that it depends. It, it depends on what the attacker's objectives are and what kind of data they compromise. So there are a lot of, uh, there's a diverse population of attackers out there. And they can have very different motives and very different playbooks. So one actor set you hear a lot about these days is, is nation states. Nation states can use hackers uh, for political, military, espionage purposes. Um, that is a pretty small set of actors, very sophisticated. By far the biggest group of actors out there is cyber criminals. Broadly speaking, uh, their motivation is to turn a profit, to monetize their access to data somehow but they have lots of <clears throat> different business models that they may use to do so. So certainly a common one, and one we heard a little bit about uh, in the plaintiff's presentation, is identity theft, stealing people's identities and using them to consummate financial transactions. And um, I'll speak to more on that in a minute. But there are other ways, too, that attackers have of monetizing their activity that don't involve uh, financial fraud on the affected users. So one example is extortion. A hacker may target particularly sensitive information like uh, compromising photos or compromising private messages and threaten to release them unless the user pays them off. Another completely different example would be spamming. So spamming is you know, abusive marketing, um, uh, mass uh, sending of emails out. And spammers sometimes use compromised email or customer lists to target their solicitation activity. Uh, they make money from the advertising messages they send. Could be based on the number of people that they can reach, or they may get paid by commission from the sales that they generate. And again, these are just examples. There really are a lot more uh, ways, but um, you know, those are some of the more common examples. Uh, briefly, there are a couple other actor sets that you see from time to time. Hacktivists, uh, that refers to ideologically motivated actors whose objective isn't so much as to make a profit as it is to draw attention to their cause somehow, embarrass their enemies, um, often by hacking into systems uh, and then leaking the information into the public domain. So for example, hacktivists might compromise personal data about a particular individual or, pers or particular business and leak it on a public website to embarrass the person or encourage other people to harass them. It's a practice often known as doxing. And finally, uh, uh, yes. Okay, wait. Uh, explain that one to me again. A do uh, and spell that word. D O X. D O X I N G. All right. And what does it mean again? Um, so it means you can take personal information about some somebody um, and leak it to embarrass them, or you can provide information about specifics about where they live uh, to try to get. Uh, people to harass them at their their house. I got it. Okay. Um, What's a problem judges have? Yes, I've, I've been involved we, uh, in some cases. We we have the marshals working on that very problem. Okay. All right. But finally, the last one I mentioned, Your Honor, is is hacking by competitors or insiders. Sometimes attackers seek information that they can use for some form of competitive business advantage. You see this often from people who leave one company and go to another but they retain credentials or something like that. Uh, and uh, they uh, may try to use that access to gain uh, access to valuable intellectual property or trade secrets and use that information uh, 
to compete against essentially the victim of the hack? Well, that would be company A uh, has an employee who leaves, goes to company B, and that employee somehow has credentials to get into his original employer so he can continue to monitor or she can, can, can monitor trade secrets and so forth? Yes. Okay. That's a common fact pattern you see, or, or they have some back door to get in. Uh, it doesn't have to be a former employer, employee. It can be um, just some independent competitor. Okay. So, uh, as I said, attackers do vary widely in, in their objectives, and as a cor corollary to that, um, they vary in the types of data that they target. Some data, obviously, is useful for certain objectives, but not for others. So taking identity theft as an example, uh, I just want to focus for a minute on what types of data hackers target when they're looking for data that's useful for identity theft and how they typically monetize that data. So the types of data useful to identity thieves are the kinds of data that you need to authorize a payment or to validate a person's identity to a financial institution or an online store some other entity that you can conduct a financial transaction with. <clears throat> the credit card information is obviously a classic example. Right? Fraudsters can use that information to make online purchases. Another example would be payment account credentials, something like a PayPal account, a username and a password for a PayPal account. Uh, that can be useful. Um, you can also have, though, non-credential, non-financial um, account credentials that Ha attackers can recycle. So for example, um, because users often use the same usernames and passwords for multiple sites, you could have a hacker compromise you know, the usernames and passwords for a website for cat lovers or something like that. For what? For cat lovers or, or whatever. I mean, it's a non-sensitive website by itself, but then the attacker can try those same usernames and passwords at lots of different sites, including banks, including stores, see if they work, and get into accounts that way. Uh, that's a practice known as credential stuffing. Um, social security numbers. That would be a different type of example. Obviously, you can't make payments with social security numbers, but that's the sort of information that can often be essential to validating a person's identity to a financial institution um, so that you can open up a new credit line in their name, for instance, or possibly take over their account. Uh, in the plaintiff's presentation, there was a mention of like challenge and response. You know when. Uh, you're trying to validate your identity to a financial institution, they ask you for certain information. They're going to ask you things for things like mother's maiden name plus last four digits of your social, things like that. And I should add, Your Honor, there was a mention earlier about definitions of PII, personal identity information. The, the states, the state governments of the U.S., all have different breach notification requirements, and they have definitions of the types of data that trigger those notification requirements. And the, the definitions typically center on this type of data. It's data that's useful for financial identity theft. So it doesn't just say first and last name. If that's breached, that, that requires notification. It says if first and last name of a person has been breached in addition to or in combination with social security number, or driver's license number, or financial account credentials, things like that, that's typically what's covered by state breach notification requirements <clears throat> because this is the sort of da danger they're, they're designed to protect against. So typically the hackers who obtain this sort of data uh, don't commit the identity theft themselves. Instead, they harvest it and sell it to others who do. And that's where the dark web uh, comes in, Your Honor. Um, and that's a subject I'm intimately familiar with. I, I, uh, as, as a former prosecutor, I had several major investigations uh, dealing with sites on the dark web. So just to talk about that term for a minute uh, and to clarify terminology, uh, before you heard the term dark web and dark net, I want to make one more distinction. Uh, this is a pet peeve of mine. These terms are often thrown around together, deep web versus dark web. Um, deep web just refers to content on the internet that has not been indexed by search engines, which is actually a huge portion of the web. So if you take the internet, 
the web is a part of the internet. The deep web is a huge part of the web. If you have a Gmail account, Your Honor, and you go to your Gmail page, you're looking at part of the deep web because your Gmail account is not something you can find by searching for it in Google. Um, so that's all deep web means. The dark web is a very small part of the web, and that refers to something much different. Uh, it, it's typically a term typically used to refer to websites whose IP address uh, is hidden from public view using specialized technologies, including the Tor network. Um, as your Honor, Mayor, how can that, uh, if it's hidden from view, how how can it be, how can anyone even find them then? Uh, well, technically, it's very complex under the hood. Uh, as was referred to earlier, it involves a lot of bouncing of traffic between different nodes until it gets to you know the other point of, of the traffic. But from a user's perspective, it's actually quite simple. Um, for, use, for user's perspective, I have a slide in a minute, um, you can just download the Tor browser, install in your system, there's a picture of it uh, there, and then uh, there you go, once you install it, you can access sites on the Tor network. Uh, you don't know their IP address, they don't know your IP address. In terms of where you find the addresses to type in, um, that information is, is, is often publicly discussed on the surface web, on the ordinary web. So there could be chat rooms or just you know, news articles or whatever that mention there's this website out there and you can find it at this address. The addresses are long strings of text and numbers that end with dot onion, but you know, other than that, it's, they're fairly easy to reach. Um, so it's important to emphasize not all the activity on the dark web is nefarious in nature. I mean, it's used, for example, by human rights activists that are trying to evade um, uh, surveillance by you know, what they view as repressive governments. Uh, there's obviously um, other uh, legitimate applications for it as well, but it is used by criminals because th it helps them hide their IP addresses from law enforcement. Uh, and that allows them to operate these websites relatively openly um, hiding in plain sight. So examples include dark markets, and that's where criminal goods and services are sold of all sorts, including drugs, including fake passports, including pirated software. Do, do you have a slide that would show me what one of those look I, like? I do. Uh, Just coming up, Your Honor. Um, so here's an example. Um, this is Alpha Bay, which was actually successfully shut down by law enforcement a couple years ago. And as you can see from the browse categories list on the left-hand side, it's essentially an online department store uh, for all sorts of criminal goods and services. Fraud. Fraud, um, drugs and chemicals, uh, counterfeit items, that would be things like counterfeit passports, et cetera, digital products, counterfeit software. Um, and here, under this is under digital goods, might as well be under fraud as well, um, are banking fulls. So before you heard the term fulls uh, in, during the plaintiff's um, tutorial, this is what fulls are. It's actually a technical term of art, a fairly technical term of art on the dark web. And what fulls mean are full account information, typically from a bank or financial institution or a retail store. <clears throat> and uh, as you can see, especially from a financial institution, Banking fulls include things like social security number, driver's license number, information about net income, all the things that you would need to impersonate someone to their bank to get control of their account or to open up a new account in the person's name. And as you can see here, you can get this information directly on dark web websites for cheap. This is $2 per account. Uh, and this is typical. There is a glut of this information on the dark web. Unfortunately, it's widely available to identity thieves who want it. So what, what would you do? You'd, you'd go, I know you say you shut that one down, but you'd go to that site and say you, got, you want to get 10 of these accounts, and yep. so you would give them $20, and they would, how, uh, how, would they would then send it to you over the internet? Yes. 
and you pay for it using bitcoins or other cryptocurrency. Um, so you know they're not taking credit cards on these sites, but they're, they're taking digital currency um, that can often be hard for law enforcement to to trace. And this could be operating anywhere in the world. It wouldn't necessarily even have to be in the USA. Correct. It could be hosted in the USA, but that would be completely uh, invisible to the, the user and very hard to, to, to determine. How many sites like that do you think they're operating right now? Um, I don't have an exact count, but there would be a number. It would probably be dozens. Dozens? Mm -hmm. All right, that's, and, and that that is part of the dark. That's part of that's part of the dark web. web. Okay. Um, but as I said, that's not the only business model used by cyber criminals. And as, as a counterpoint, I wanted to talk for a minute about spamming, uh, which I mentioned earlier. Okay, so spammers uh, engage in abusive ma mass marketing, and they don't need to perpetrate identity theft as part of their activity. So they're not looking for the sort of data that we were just seeing on Alpha Bay. They don't need social security numbers, that sort of thing. They're looking for contact information and marketing information that they can use to target their solicitation activities. Sometimes, certainly not always, but sometimes that information comes from hacking. So for example, there have been major data breaches where the data stolen consisted simply of email addresses and names. Uh, that information by itself is of very little value to identity thieves. But it is useful to spammers, potentially, seeking to blast out messages to as many users as possible. And what so, would those messages say? All sorts of things. So uh, often spam is used to sell things like off-brand drugs, mail enhancements, uh, many, many things. Uh, it, it, I mean, it, it's uh, it, the click rate, the, the uh, rate of actually generating a sale can be very, very small. There was one study that showed, like, I forget what it was, but something like one ten thousandth of one percent of recipients actually, you know, uh, purchase something. But that's the game, is to send out messages to as many people as possible um, to, to, to get a click, to get a buyer. So if you send out a million, you might get a hundred. Is that it? Is that something the idea? like that. Okay. Okay. Um, are, and then are, are these real sales, or are they just phony, uh, phony sales? Both, Your Honor. It could be both. Um, so similarly, customer profile information, like where a person's from or what their education level is, that can be useful to spammers just as it is to ordinary marketers because it can be used to uh, target spamming activity. When this data is hacked, you don't necessarily expect, expect to see it show up on dark market websites. It's not really where it's ordinarily sold. Um, unlike something like a list of credit card numbers, um, in which is obviously illicit in its, on its face uh, to sell, the contact and marketing information may not appear illicit on its face necessarily, depending on how it's presented. And so you actually can see this data sometimes just sold on the ordinary or surface web. Um, so, you know, I think the basic point here, Your Honor, is it's just important to distinguish between um, these types of information because, uh, you know, a lot of the assumptions that you might have in a case where information like credit card data is stolen or social security numbers are stolen uh, would not equally apply in a case where something like uh, contact or, or marketing information has been compromised. Thank you. Thank you. All right, so uh, let's go to your next presenter. Your Honor, we're back with Mr. Milliken is going to resume on the subject of how companies, or as you said, the industry generally defends against attack, and then he'll talk about how, sp how Facebook's general approach to security right. complies yeah, with Yeah, you've got a little less than 20 minutes. So. That's fine, Your Honor. All right, please go ahead. Okay, so... I'm going to first, first be sure to use the mic now. Yes. So I'm going to address a little about how companies defend against attacks. Um, and to start with, it's worth stressing that there is no magic bullet solution here. Um, it's uh, th there's n there's no real simple answer of how we should defend uh, as an industry. Um, 
it would be wonderful if there were, for example, some single product or technology that we could all deploy. De deploy. It would certainly make uh, my life a lot easier in uh, working in security, but uh, unfortunately this doesn't exist. Um, and so instead, what's necessary is a series of different individual security measures, um, which can then each be effective ag against some limited set of risks. Uh, and so you are not asked to hear about encryption today. And this is a great example of the principle of security measures, which are very powerful in some situations, but uh, not so powerful in others. And so encryption is uh, this process of encoding data so that it can only be read by those who have the necessary key. Um, so if you have a piece of data to encrypt, uh, which we call the plain text, uh, then you can pass it through an encryption algorithm using an encryption key uh, to get something which is now essentially unreadable, and we call this the ciphertext. Um, and that is unreadable to anyone who doesn't possess the decryption key which they can use alongside the decryption algorithm to recover the plain text. And um, in some contexts, the encryption and decryption key will be the same, um, and some they won't. Um, and as I say, this is very important security control in some situations, but not others. Um, but let's look at a couple of places where it can be effective. So the first is um, encryption of data at rest. Um, and so data at rest encryption is uh, really encryption of stored data. For example, if you have data stored in a database. So if we look back at this attack where um, someone has uh, actually got into the company network uh, with malware, they're accessing a database. And so their goal is to exfiltrate data from this database. And they want to steal the data this way. But now all they've stolen is ciphertext, uh, which is meaningless to them. And so for them to actually complete this attack, it requires access to the decryption keys, and then it's possible for the company to sometimes defend these decryption keys um, a, a little more than the database. They can be more locked down. And another example where encryption is very useful is encryption of data in transit. Um, so for example, um, when you securely connect to a website, so the first thing that happens here is something that's called the handshake, uh, which happens between uh, your device and the remote web server. And a, a couple of things happen here, but one of them is that encryption keys are decided upon, um, which are then shared between these uh, two ends, which can then communicate securely. And so, for example, when connecting to a secure website, um, we will typically see HTTPS. Um, HTTP being the standard protocol used to communicate with websites, and S um, being added to indicate that this is now secure. So now if we look back at uh, the attacker attacking the network, so this is like the at attack that I had demonstrated with the BBC. Um, an attacker in this situation um, can now only access the ciphertext, and so they have no way of actually reading or manipulating this data. Um, and this is in, um, how, for example, the BBC is no longer vulnerable um, to the attack I performed a few years ago. Well, let me ask you a question. Mm -hmm. Let's say that the hacker is monitoring the entire uh, exchange of information. Wouldn't the hacker then have uh, eavesdropped on what the keys were going to be so that they could now decode everything? Uh, that's a very good question, Your Honor. Um, so what actually happens within this key exchange is um, it's uh, called asymmetric cryptography. And uh, I, I probably won't get into too many of the details of this, but um, essentially it's similar to the situation I described before where the, uh, the encryption and the decryption keys are different. And so um, in, in this situation, for example, the two ends can send each other their encryption keys uh, but not the decryption keys and hold the decryption keys sensitive. They, um, and so any data that's transmitted, having used the encryption keys, um, is still secure because the decryption key has never been sent. This isn't exactly how it, how it works in this situation, but it's... Uh, so the answer is the uh, hacker cannot decode. That's even correct, even if they monitor the entire exchange, that's uh, correct, they yes. don't get enough of the keys to decode. Exactly. Well, why wouldn't everybody do that? Or is that the way it works? Everyone does that. 
Uh, so HTTPS is becoming increasingly common okay. on the internet, yes. Okay. Um, All right, so, so if you remember the example you gave earlier, you're at the Wi-Fi coffee shop mm -hmm. using free Wi-Fi. Yes. Uh, would this kind of encryption um, save you in that situation so that uh, no one could monitor your, your uh, they might monitor it, but they wouldn't be able to decode it? Is that the way it would work? Exactly, yes. They, they would not know what data was being transmitted. I see. Okay. All right. Good. Go ahead. So this is very powerful, of course. Um, but um, there are situations where the security goals that uh, we desire can't be achieved through encryption. Um, so, for example, if, um, if there's a website where someone may log into their account and expect to see their data, then this website needs to be able to transmit this data to the user. Um, if, it, if it had some ciphertext which it sent to the user, which the user couldn't decrypt, that, that wouldn't be useful. So they need to be able to send the plain text, even if it is encrypted in transit. Um, and so, for example, this does mean, though, that if an attacker is able to access a user's account in such a system, then because they're impersonating this user, any data that's visible to this account um, could also be transmitted to the attacker. Um, Wait, say, so go through that again. Mm -hmm. So let's say you have an account with, that's in the cloud. You're saying that the information in the cloud should be in plain text and, and store, stored in plain text? So it doesn't necessarily need to be, to be stored in plain text, um, but it needs to be accessible to the company in plain text. So, for example, um, if I'm logging into my Gmail account, um, it doesn't really matter how Google stores that, but they need to be able to load it into their web server and then transmit it to me in a form that I can actually read. And so if someone else were accessing my Gmail account, um, they would also um, have that data transmitted to them. But couldn't Gmail use these keys to encrypt it in transit? They, they can, yes. Uh, so it's encrypted in transit um, between, uh, so my web browser and them, and uh, an attacker's web browser and them. But if an attacker has actually gained access to my account, then um, the keys which are used to transmit the data aren't um, are relevant in this situation because um, it's, um, this transit encryption ensures that the two endpoints are still able to decrypt the data. So okay. we're not defending against a network attacker in this situation. Right. But that was a very good question. So if encryption can't, uh, can't provide our magic bullet, um, what, what do we actually need? Uh, because this principle does extend to all security measures, really. Um, there, there is no single security measure which can provide a complete solution to protection. And instead, we need... Um, to provide comprehensive security programs using broad range of controls. Um, so we've listed a, a few of these potential options on, on the slide. Um, of course, there, there are more that, uh, that, that may be needed. Um, but the big thing really is that there is no single checklist of security rules to follow. And so the, the examples given on the slide previously, um, the, the, each of them can be useful in, in situations, but companies vary widely. The systems that these companies run vary, vary widely, as do the threats that they face. And of, of course, all of these things uh, evolve over time. So kind of taking a checklist and just ticking the boxes doesn't really suffice um, because um, basically because of this asymmetry between attack and defense, where an attacker just needs to find a situation where you haven't defended. So if you've ticked nine out of ten boxes, but there's a tenth that uh, wasn't in the list but an attacker can make use of, then that's going to, that could be a problem and could, could risk exposing vulnerabilities. And so it's really important for companies to take a risk-based approach, um, allocating their resources based on the, the risks that they face, the threats that they face, and where they can be most effective. Um, but also, when designing pro uh, products, it's important sometimes to balance security against functionality. Uh, for example, you could have a, 
a perfectly secure product, but it probably wouldn't do anything uh, because um, the more functionality you add, um, the more risk there is of uh, security issues. Um, so when I say you could have a perfectly secure product, I'm really referring to something which doesn't exist um, and can't exist. So an important part of a security uh, program is the most common way for hackers to get into a social media uh, system. I, I, is there a common, most common way to get in? Uh, I, I'm afraid I don't know, Your Honor. Well, all right, a different question. Let's say the, the hacker gets in to the social media and they can access one person's account. Does that then mean they can access everyone's account, or is it just that one person, or how, how far does the problem extend? That would likely depend on how the attacker gained access to the, uh, the account. Uh, uh, it, it would really depend on the specific situation. Okay. Do you know anything about the, what happened in this case? I, I, I don't know much about it. I wasn't involved. Okay, in I don't, I, it's premature. I, but. It, I, I do have some thoughts in my mind or questions I have in my mind. All right, so uh, please continue on. Sure. So um, an important part of an information security program is uh, being able to detect and respond to incidents when they do happen. Um, and both of these are quite challenging. Uh, it's not a trivial exercise at all. So for example, detecting at attacks can be very hard. Which can? Uh, detecting attacks, uh -huh. um, because it's often very difficult to uh, distinguish attacker attack activity, for example, from uh, regular activity. Um, but also in, in responding to incidents, uh, it takes time, of course, to investigate and analyze, analyze the scope of the problem, the, the cause of it, and indeed how to remediate it. And so if we um, zoom in here on detection time, um, this is a graphic uh, from the 2018 Verizon Data Breach Investigations Report. And what we're seeing here is on the left um, how long compromises took to occur um, based on a number of compromises that they investigated. Um, and this means the time between an attack starting and sensitive information being extracted. Uh, it doesn't account for the time that an attacker may have investigated the, an issue um, or the duration necessarily once the attack succeeded. Um, but the really striking thing here is that the vast majority of these, 87%, took minutes or less um, to actually compromise data. Whereas on the right, we're, we're looking uh, after the compromise took place, uh, we see that only 3% of these attacks were actually discovered as quickly within minutes or less, and 68%, so over two-thirds of them, um, took months or longer to be detected. So let's um, take, take a little time now to look at um, how Facebook approaches security. Um, and so this is um, a multifaceted um, enterprise, of course. Uh, we have a number of components in our information security program. Um, but I'll focus on product security. So this is how we approach preventing vulnerabilities from being exposed in our products. And there are a couple of key elements to how we approach this. Um, so the first one is security design by design. And this means that we, prevent, uh, we focus on preventing bugs from occurring in the first place. Um, how do we do this? Well, we try to bake security principles and learnings directly into the development process. Uh, we have a number of uh, core libraries and frameworks that engineers use um, to build most of our products. And these are designed to make engineers' jobs easier so it means that using them is the natural way to build products at Facebook. Um, so making these libraries and frameworks secure by default helps to make sure that uh, the code that our engineers write in the most natural way is, is itself secure by default. And so um, the goal here is make the easiest way, way to write code the safe way to write code. And an example of this is a technology called XHP. Um, uh, this is a technology which is used to help construct web pages. Um, so, for example, um, Ms. France earlier described um, an attack from the OWASP top 10 list um, called a cross-site scripting vulnerability. Um, and um, the great thing about this technology, XHP, is that when it is used to generate a web page, and it is the easiest way to generate a web page within Facebook, 
um, this problem of cross-site scripting is practically eliminated. And so um, the, the need to, to, to worry so much about this attack um, is greatly reduced. Wait, what was the name of the, that method? Um, the technology is called XHP. XHP. Yes. Um, uh -huh. so, and so the, 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 the second core part of our approach is called defense in depth. Um, so um, in the interest of time, I won't dwell on this slide because the next one uh, covers it um, in, in more detail. But really what we're talking about with defense in depth is having multiple layers of security. Um, and so we want to maximize the number of things which serve to prevent any given security vulnerability from existing or at least being exploitable. And so hopefully any potential vulnerability uh, may be prevented in a number of different ways. So we can think of this like a funnel with multiple, multiple filters, uh, each of which prevents a number of bugs. Um, may let's say through, but in aggregate, um, the goal is that there's a very good chance uh, of all bugs, or most bugs indeed, being caught, or at least. When you, when you mean bugs, you mean what? Um, what is a bug? A, a bug is um, a situation in which software behaves incorrectly. All right, that's so, what I thought. Um, so, so it's, in other words, there's a programming error. Um, potentially, yes. Oh. Um, and what we're really interested for security is when bugs are vulnerabilities, and so when they allow someone to actually take some action that they shouldn't be able to do. And so let's say we have this funnel with a set of potential bugs going into the top. Now let's look, some, look at some of the layers. So the first one is secure coding frameworks, and this is really what we're talking about here is our security by design. So a number of frameworks, uh, such as XHP. And so this layer should prevent a lot of bugs from being created. But as some do get through, um, we have another layer of automated testing tools. So this is for when frameworks can't prevent all the issues, uh, it's often possible to detect issues. Um, so we have tools for inspecting and finding, or inspecting the code, and for finding bugs, uh, which work quickly and across our entire code base. Uh, a good example of this is static analysis, um, which is a process of automatically scanning code and detecting certain types of issues. And often when, we're, when, we, when we become aware of a new type of bug, um, we will be able to add detection rules so that static analysis can start detecting this. Is that during the software writing process and before it becomes launched, uh, or is this after it's launched and customers are using it? Uh, this is both, actually. Uh, so our automated testing tools uh, will run uh, when engineers submit code um, um, as, say, candidate code to be uh, landed into our products. Um, but also, it's, um, because sometimes we learn about new issues and we add new rules, we also run these across the existing code base in our existing products uh, so that we can apply our learnings to what is already out there. So with these top two layers, we've caused a lot of bugs, but there are potentially still some remaining. So next we do have peer design and code reviews. So um, this is to make sure that we, um, someone has, al has always checked code before it, um, b before it gets deployed, and so someone has always approved it. And so, um, when we have new products coming out, often they'll go through a security review, working with security experts to help with this. And then finally, we have our red teams um, and our bug bounty program, and these are so the red teams are people that we, em that we employ, uh, security experts inside, and the bug bounty program are people externally who we incentivize. And the goal is that um, if the bugs do hit our products, we want to find them. And so our red team will try to attack us as if they were an advanced attacker. And our bug bounty program uh, tries to ensure that if people do find bugs uh, um, on, from the outside, they're, more, they're incentivized to tell us about them rather than um, keeping them to themselves or worse, telling someone else about it. What does that mean? Do they get some money for telling you that? Sorry? Do they get money for saying, we've discovered a bug in your program? Yes, if they find a valid security vulnerability, then they, okay. they will get But this is also an iterative progress process. And so um, if we're detecting something a lot, we'll start to try to prevent it. If we see something a lot in routine internal review, 
will try to push it further up um, in the prevention and detection process. Likewise, for red team exercises and bug bounty programs, when we learn about new issues, uh, we will try to prevent them from hitting the product in the first place. And this then allows us to catch more bugs more easily. And um, in the interest of time, I'll... Um, yeah, because you've got about two minutes, but go ahead. Okay. <laughs> so um, um, the, the, the key thing here to mention is, is that often technology that we need uh, doesn't already exist. And so uh, we've actually built a number of industry-leading technologies that can help to prevent um, vulnerabilities. Um, and so I've, I've listed some of these on the slide, and, um, but I, I won't go into the details. I've is mentioned. this a true statement? I just that if you had brilliant programmers who wrote perfect code, you could devise a Facebook type system where millions of people were using it, where no one would ever get hacked. Or is that just, is, or is that just impossible? Uh, uh, I'm, I'm talking about absolute perfection here. Um, is that possible? I, I believe absolute imp imperfection is impossible, but uh, actually even if you did have perfect code, um, it's, um, we, we still need to think about, for example, hardware vulnerabilities. Um, and so sometimes it can just push the risk further down the stack. Um, but could a hacker, if, if you did have perfect software code, could a hacker located, say, in Lithuania, could, could a hacker in Lithuania hack into your servers uh, if, if the code was perfect? It, it, it's, it's difficult to say. Um, if, if there was absolutely perfect code, which to clarify I, I don't believe exists, um, but um, then, then may, maybe that could protect against it. But as I say, the, the complexity of these, pro, these um, systems, for example in Facebook we have over 100 million lines of code. Um, it means that like detecting, anticipating the number of potential interactions is just impossible. 100 million. That's a lot. Yes. <laughs> it is indeed. Uh, okay. Okay, you're, you're, you make one last point and then we'll bring it to a close. Okay, so I'll uh, quickly summarize then. Um, so to, to summarize, uh, well, attackers may take many approaches to compromising data. And there's a significant asymmetry that we have to contend with between defense uh, compared to attack, particularly in the case of zero-day vulnerabilities, uh, which there's been no chance to fix and defend against. Um, there's a wide variety of motivations and objectives for attackers. So, for example, many do want to commit identity theft or financial fraud, but there are many other motivations, such as spamming, for example. Um, in defense, it's very important to take a risk-based approach because threats vary by company. Each company must decide what its risk are so, risks are so it can prioritize what to defend against. And finally, um, Facebook leverages many layers of defense, and um, the, f the primary and first layer of this is security by design. So we aim to prevent bugs uh, before they're even there to detect. Thank you very much, Your Honor. Okay, thank you. You've been very helpful. All right, uh, your hour is up. Thank you very much, Your Honor. I have hard uh, copies uh, for your clerk, both yeah, single side uh, and double sided, depending on what. Thank you. Want. We appreciate that, but also send the emails so that we can put the electronic versions on the uh, website. We will do that this afternoon, Your Honor. Thank you. Thank you I very had much. A brief question. Sure. Is it okay to submit that in PDF format, or do you want it in PowerPoint format? I think we want it in PDF, don't we? What? What? Both? Why do we need both? I, I don't know. What, what kind can you submit it in? Your Honor, we could submit it in either, although the PD, a PDF form is probably more secure. Uh, so we might suggest <laughs> that we submit it in that way. I think we both we all agree on that. Let's use P, PDF and be sure that you give us the key. <laughs> yes, we will do so, Your Honor. We'll understand what, it, what we're putting up. Thank you.